Thank you, Dr. Gunaratna, Professor Sudarshini Vasra Tantri, and my friend and colleague, Dr. Chaturvi Suravira, for inviting me today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about how we could live in the present moment and how we can manage these diverse emotions that go on in our mind, which makes our mind like a tornado most of the time. And because our mind is in such a disarray, we can't really enjoy life. So in order to start, I find the stories of people that I know are really inspiring us to get certain concepts right. So I want to tell you about two stories. One is, uh, I think some of the doctors who were students at the medical faculty may have heard this story over like 23 years that I was there. I always talk about this. It was about one of my friends who was at university with me in Delhi. Uh, I went to university in India. And let's say her name is Sonali. So Sonali was an exceptionally beautiful person. I met her when I was 18, when I went to university. And uh, I can remember sometimes when she used to talk, I used to look at her face as opposed to anything else because she was so good looking. And for her, it was very easy to get a first division every year with merit and gold medals. She didn't have to study so hard, but things really stuck on her mind. She came from a very wealthy and very prestigious family from India. So she finished her first degree and then she decided she wanted to do law. So I lost touch with her after my first degree, but we had common friends. So I used to kind of ask about Sonali over the years. And I heard that she had met this um, very wealthy Indian man who even had their private jet. So this husband used to travel from Delhi to Hyderabad, where he used to work in a jet every day. So that's the kind of wealth they had. And then they went on to have two little daughters. So by that time, I had, you know, really lost touch with Sonali and I had come back to Sri Lanka. When we were about 27 years of age, one of our common friends called me from India and told me that Sonali had passed away, that she had died. So I was quite surprised and I asked her what happened. She said, well, you know, Sonali had taken her life. So, so I was surprised to find out because in our life, we make a lot of emphasis on this checklist of material things that we should have in life. Good looks, prestige, academic qualifications, first divisions in these academic qualifications, wealth, a house, um, uh, two vehicles, one vehicle, then marriage, children, children doing really well, overseas vacations. So it transpired that what it showed me was that, you know, sometimes we seem to be having many things, but our minds may not be with us and it can be a disservice to us. Now that's story number one. Story number two is about 15 years ago at the Faculty of Medicine, we invited several people who had done exceptionally well in their various careers um, to come and give a motivational talk to our students. So I had invited one person and therefore I was a part of that program. And another colleague of mine had invited another gentleman who I didn't know anything about, but I had to go and greet him at the Kinsey Road entrance of the medical faculty. So I was waiting for this vehicle to come and this very young man got out in a, on, in a wheelchair. They helped him into a wheelchair. I didn't know his story. Fortunately, we had a lift at that time. So we took him to the upstairs lecture hall and his story went like this. In the late 1980s, when there were conflict between the JVP forces and the government, many universities were closed for about three, four years. And this young man wanted to do engineering and he got a scholarship to Luhumba University in Russia, which is a exceptionally very um, established ancient university. So he went to Russia to do his medicine. Unfortunately for him at that time, the Cold War had ended in Europe and Eastern Europe and Northern Europe was merging, which led to a lot of student unrest and animosity towards foreign students. So when this young man was in his hostel, fifth floor, and there's a huge student unrest in Russia and somebody just pushed him from the balcony and he fell and he sustained a spinal cord injury. Uh, he was there in Russia for two months going through some basic treatments. He came here and the doctor said, you know, you'll have to have independent life on a wheelchair. There is no cure for this condition. And, um, and he had thought, well, what am I going to do? Forget about doing engineering. Forget about having a first degree. I cannot even walk. 
and there is no cure in sight. So he thought apparently to himself like, well, what am I gonna do with my life? And he thought, well, why don't I work on the needs of the disabled people in this country, not only for myself, for everybody, may I be a voice for that? And he formed the Sri Lanka Disability Association at a, at, at a very young age, in the early 20s, similar age as Sonali. And then it was because of his advocacy and activity that we now see ra ramps, you know, those uh, handrails. Then we have those uh, disability car park signs on supermarkets. So why I want to give you these two stories is that they're very diverse. We have Sonali who seemed to have everything, the checklist completed, who decided that, you know, she would rather pass away and take her life. Then we have this young man from Lumba University who seemingly not only lost his education, but a significant part of his mobility, but he went on to do greater things, not only for himself, but for the world. Now, what that shows really is, is that our life is really very much in our hands and how much you want to do and progress psychologically and productive wise is really at your hands. So this has been a question that psychologists have looked into, I think over, over years, but maybe centuries in the form of philosophy. And one particular psychologist by the name of Daniel Goldman, who was a professor in psychology at Harvard University, where in the late 1970s, apparently uh, Daniel Goldman used to stay in his uh, Harvard University office and look down at Harvard University, the courtyard. And you know, you see all these Nobel laureates and grant holders and all these world-class award holders walking up and down and top-class scientists and musicians and whatnot. And he saw that one common thing most of these people had was they didn't look happy. But they were highly achieved. They were highly achieved, but they did not look happy. So Daniel Goldman was really interested to see why is that? How could you have so many seemingly achievements, but really you're not a, that much of a happy person? So what's the point in life? So he went on to do a lot of literature reviews and surveys, and he publicized this term called emotional intelligence which is I think most of us, if you don't have to be a mental health professional, but many people have heard of this concept where we know now that of course, average intelligence is required for productivity and efficiency and effectiveness in our day-to-day -day life. However, the real leap into productivity and mental health and well-being and uh, good interpersonal skills and long-term happiness you need to have what we call emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is therefore a set of four characteristics that define your mental health. So I'm gonna roughly run through these four characteristics and spend my talk really on how we can be this emotionally intelligent person, or if you are already there to some level, how you can be more. So emotional intelligence, therefore, it, it, it has four qualities, which is the first is the emotionally intelligent person is somebody who's very aware of the functioning of his mind. Now, many people aren't aware exactly where they are psychologically. That is why when we do this research, when we look at reports of criminals who have been convicted of murder, 80% of them had, it was not planned murder. They had, just got angry, a shoot of blood had come to their head, as they say. There would have been like a cat, or even a coconut was there. Then they slammed it on somebody nearby and that person dies and you're in prison for the rest of your life. So, and then they say, then how about things like jealousy? Now we could have a lot of envy and jealousy towards our own family, our own friends, our own colleagues, and we pass, we don't even know. And when we don't know, we pass nasty comments that could actually ruin relationships. So the first dimension of emotional intelligence is somebody who knows right now, I feel very restless. Right now, I feel quite irritated. I feel like telling off this person. So you're really aware of the dialogues that are happening in your mind and the feelings of emotions in your body. The second dimension of emotional intelligence is the ability to manage these things in a very healthy way. And the key point is healthy because you could manage your anger in an unhealthy way. 
by telling off somebody, passing a nasty remark, writing a pessim at somebody, putting anonymous remark at the Facebook or Instagram. Those are unhealthy ways of managing emotions. However, the emotionally intelligent person is somebody who knows, well, right now I feel quite envious of my best friend because she's looking really beautiful today more than me. And I feel like telling her, you have put on a little bit of weight because that's what people do, you know, when somebody looks nice, they you know, just to put that person down. You are aware you want to do this. However, you have sufficient controls to hold that within you, not to act on it, not to speak on it and contain it in you until the feeling passes. Now that's emotional intelligence. So that doesn't mean that when you're emotionally intelligent, you don't get these unwholesome emotions. Of course you do, but it's the management that is key. And the third quality of emotional intelligence, a person who manages their mind well, is somebody who's also able to read another person. Now that's a really a key thing because we now know that society is rather maladaptive. We come across many people who might seem to mean well to us, but they actually don't. It can be your family, it can be your relative, it can be colleagues, it can be friends, it can be a spouse, it can be even children who may tell you the beautiful things, say how wonderful you are, how fabulous you are, et cetera. But behind that is a knife that may be really detrimental to you. An emotionally intelligent person is somebody who can suss out somebody's ill intentions. And when you suss out somebody's ill intentions, it doesn't mean that you dump that person but you're able to keep a relatively good distance that that person's harm towards you is less. That's what we mean by social awareness. So it's very being very savvy about whom you get close to your fold and whom you keep at a distance in order to protect yourself. The fourth quality of emotional intelligence is of course relationship management. And I think the first question I'd like to ask you is, what is the longest relationship that you've had in life? I'm near 50, and I think my, my longest relationship that I had was is my friend from grade four. So you would think it's a 40 year friendship, it's a long time. I have an aunt who is 84, and her best of friends are people whom she was at primary school at school, and that's like 60, 70 years of age. You know, so that's a long relationship. So, but are your relationships short? Are there just those three, four years that you were at university and once you got out of university, it doesn't mean only intimate relationships, platonic relationships, neighborhood relationships. It's also relationships with even acquaintances like the janitor or the security man or the person, the clerk who worked in the other department. Are you able to take it long-term? Now you might wonder why do we have to have long-term relationships and how, does, how is that an indicator of mental health? Why it is an indicator of mental health is that we all have weaknesses. I have weaknesses, Sudarshini has weaknesses, Dr. Gunaratna has weaknesses, Shehan has weaknesses, everybody has. Are we have, do we have the capacity to be patient with somebody's weakness, tolerate it and still be with that person? If you have that, you're emotionally intelligent. Unless of course, that person is thoroughly abusive towards you, then you of course, gently and slowly wean yourself off that person. However, everybody has their flaws. The, the friend who doesn't text back on time, they, they text back in two weeks time, you know, and then they say, oh, so sorry. When they meet at the supermarket, I text why didn't you re respond then? Why do you tell the supermarket that you got the text? But you tolerate this. So do you have a ability to tolerate people's weaknesses and still maintain that relationship. So these are the qualities of a person who can manage their emotions well, because only if you manage your emotions well and in a holistic manner, you could be of this caliber. Now the question really is, is that how do we actually become this person? Because we do know there are many people on our recent, I was yesterday actually, one of my um, BSc physiotherapy students had done a research on present moments on emotional intelligence. And I was just looking through the results uh, and the, the, the population was another university at the degree course in the country. And emotional intelligence is quite low, you know, in, in young people in the country. And we see that commonly occurring um, results in other parts of our country too. So it seems that this 
So this very desirable human quality called emotional intelligence is not well developed in our country. And there can be many reasons for that, but we're not going to go there, but we are going to talk about how can we be emotional intelligent if you are invested in being like this. Some people are not invested in wanting to be emotionally intelligent. They just want to achieve, get those promotions, be in that committee, be that president, be that here, be that having that one car, then another car, and then three cars, getting. So that's the, it's an achievement driven life. However, we do know that this achievement driven life, where status positions and material possessions actually don't give a sense of well being in the long run. It is actually these other human qualities that gives a sense of well being. So if you're really interested and invested in being this deeper version of yourself, you need to know how to be emotionally intelligent. Now, of course, psychology offers many techniques to be emotionally intelligent, manage your emotions well. But I'm going to talk to you about maybe about three, two or three, three or four techniques given the time we have. And of all the techniques I'm going to talk to you about, this particular one, living in the present moment, is I would think the most paramount. So what does living in the present moment mean? It means just being here and now, isn't it? So for example, what is my current experience now? It is looking at this laptop and I can't really quite see what's there because I haven't got my specs. My experience is that I've got a lot of a tension headache on my right side of my temple and I can see Dulangi sitting there in her red sari. Then I can see Shehan and Chatru, and I can see from the corner of my eye, Stashini and Dr. Gundrat, and I can see some Xers on these chairs. That really is my current experience. A person who lives in the present moment endeavors to keep their mind on this. What is life right now? And you might then wonder, well, isn't that what I do all the time? No, of course not majority, if I would say 99.99% of the people, that means statistically 100%, would live in three different other locations, the past, the future, and the fantasy world. Because they find those dead places such fun. You know, you might be sitting, actually listening to this webinar because you thought that would give to it, but actually your mind was with Anusha, who was your preschool friend so many years ago. It's just, Anusha's name just popped into your mind. And now you may be even browsing Facebook to find out where Anusha is. So you had lived in the past, not connected to the webinar that you so faithfully registered. Then you might also live in the future or what you might do in the weekend. What would you cook for dinner? What would happen in a month's time? Would you be able to go on that trip to Anuradhapur or Kinyo or Timbuktu or where do you have planned? So your mind is now put out there. And of course, for most people, the most amazing place is fantasy. You know, thinking of things that will never happen to you, like right? that Nobel Prize. But still imagining you will get it. And thinking how you'll go to Oslo, Norway and get this Nobel Prize. And what you will wear. Would you do wear a sari or Western attire? Would the people in your village be envious or happy? You know, things of those nature. And you live in that balls of clouds and then you get some joy. But if I were to ask you, if you had been at least being aware of this process, whenever your mind went to the future, past and the fantasy, at that moment, you may have got some satisfaction. But after that, what is the feeling that you get? It's a sense of restlessness disappointment and this is the reason is our mind knows it has been falsely placed it knows it however much you try to convince that the past was fun or the future is going to be fun or the fantasy is even more fun it's not because it's not the truth so on the other hand a person who is interested and invested in their psychological well-being is somebody who when the mind wanders to these three places gently brings it back so how would you do it practically in, in a daily life you get up in the morning you know you're up that your mind has woken up some people you don't even know they have to just check am i awake or is this a nightmare kind of thing then when they place their feet on the ground they know their feet are on the ground and that they're looking for their slippers then they're aware they're walking to the washroom then they are aware that their mind has gone to the kinds of sandwiches that you might make for breakfast. 
usually you will start planning the sandwich while walk to the washroom because you want to do two things at the same time to save time and energy and money kind of thing but a person who is practicing present moment awareness wouldn't do that they might feel inclined to but as long as the mind wanders the sandwich they bring their mind gently to the walking process open the door go into the sink open the sink tap and then again the mind wanders to what a nasty man the boss is or the webinar you have to do should we wear sari or salva kameez or pants you know, the, the mind goes out then again that person brings the mind back to open the tap process because that is the truth at that moment so like that throughout the day 24/7 365 days how many years that you live you keep on training your mind to bring back here to bring back here to bring back here when you keep on training your mind to be with you just as your body is then this qualities of emotional intelligence starts growing because when your mind is with you you can see exactly the roots and the little seeds of anger that comes up that it is growing the envy or the jealousy or the joy or the excitement and when you can catch hold of an emotion as it arises you're better placed to manage it because you have strength to curb it nip it off the bud before it overtakes you and then when you are in the present moment and very much here you are able to suss out people's intentions towards you you can say that person doesn't mean well to me the way that person is looking the non verbal gestures aren't that accurate but this one's non verbal gestures mean sincerity i need to keep that person in distance but keep get this person close to me when you are very much in the present moment you are able to tolerate other people's weaknesses and be patient so therefore when you start living in the present moment you become tolerant of negative emotions of other people and most importantly of yours you become tolerant because you realize through your own experience that anger or this envy or sadness or joy or excitement or contentment or peace comes it stays and it goes everything is like that so why get overly excited about any emotions and with that experiential understanding you so you can tolerate any kinds of emotions as it arises and when you can tolerate emotions as it arises you become able to disengage from your unhealthy habits and behaviors so if you are a person who likes to miss you certain substances or go on extreme shopping sprees or um, you know is used as pornography or addicted to it or you have explosive anger outbursts and you want to do something about it but you just couldn't when you practice present moment awareness you're able to disengage yourself from this unhealthy habits and behaviors why because when you live in the present you're able to see something that occurs in your mind and stay with it because why your mind is not here but in the activity that you're doing so therefore living in the present moment is a very useful strategy to manage one's emotions if you're interested in living in the present moment and want to know about it there's a lot of information on this and the context of mindfulness uh, which you can see on the internet there are also mindfulness apps freely available on your smartphone that you could have that helps you to be mindful now um there are two ways in which we can be mindful one is of course in the daily activities that you're doing so for example if you go back home and today in the evening you want to make a carrot curry or a carrot soup or something to do with carrots or fish or whatever how would you therefore practice present moment awareness so while you're washing the carrots you'll be very your mind is actually well placed there and when the mind wanders maybe to your online work your daughter's online work the fact that you had to wash your dog or water the plants or there's too much of water in the plants wherever the mind has wandered you gently bring your mind back the process you had with the carrots so if i was to give you an analogy for it it would be for something like you know, we have this uh, book racks at home and on this book racks we place books so the books are placed on the rack beautifully so that it doesn't fall likewise our mind when we practice present moment awareness has to be placed on 
the activity you are doing, just as the book is placed on the book rack. So every time your mind wanders to other places and things that haven't still occurred or things have passed, bring your mind back to the activity, whether it's brushing your teeth, washing your dog, texting somebody, talking to your daughter, talking to your spouse, combing your hair, whatever it is, keep your mind with you. Another way in which we can practice and develop our emotional intelligence by learning to live in the present moment is meditation. Now, meditation, I just you know, tell you what, what it is and what it is not because there's so much of information on meditation, all sorts of claims being made, which has led to mental health issues in some people. So most people think that meditation is a practice where one fine day you will not have thoughts. That doesn't happen. Because then you're like a dead person, isn't it? You're like a zombie, you're a mummy. Of course, you will have thoughts, but you will have thoughts that are only relevant. The problem with us is we have relevant thoughts and have a lot of irrelevant thoughts. You know, we just build a mountain out of a molehill. For example, I, have, I just remembered a story from the Buddhist scriptures. There was uh, these two monks, an elderly monk and a younger monk, and the elderly monk was um, developed, enlightened, but being so, he had, of course, not making these proclamations. The younger monk hated being in the robes and he wished he wasn't. He was about 18. The younger monk just you know, had his dhani in the morning, in the afternoon, and his day was really boring. He was weighed into disrobe. And one of his activities he had to do was he had to fan this older monk at about four o'clock in the afternoon so that the folder monk, while the older monk is sitting on the veranda. So he really hated that as well, but had no choice. So while fanning the older monk one day, this thought popped up into the younger monk's head. How annoying is this? What life? So, you know, we also get thoughts like this, no? and we are just, what is this, like that. Now, the younger monk didn't know anything about present moment awareness or mindfulness. So what did he do? He, he went with this thought. Then he thought, yeah, how fun it would have been if I was in the village. You know, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm 18 years of age and I had all these friends. We used to go to the river and bathe and climb trees. I wonder how uh, Anusha is doing. My friend from preschool, before I got into the robes, we had a really good friendship and she was very pretty also. In fact, now Anusha might be also about 17 and 18 years of age. I have a feeling that if I meet Anusha now, there could be quite a spark there. We might even have a relationship, but I think our parents wouldn't mind getting us married. And when we get married, Anusha's parents were weird, so they did small gives a small chain of cultivation or paddy cultivation, small block. And my parents might give us a bull or two, and we can really make a living. I think we should make a hut near our chain of cultivation and have at least three children, not two, three, important. The problem is Anusha is, um, has a ten had a tendency of having a temper problem, even at the preschool. So if by any chance Anusha hits our children when they misbehave, that would really annoy me. And if that happens, I'm going to hit Anusha like this, Hamdro turned back and told the Podi Hamdro, Podi Swain Hansa, Mimi, Luku Hamdro Metanine, Anusha Neve, because Hamdro has some psychic problem. Now, we are also like that, isn't it? We have thoughts about a given situation, maybe about 5%, and the remaining 90% are concocted thoughts based on which we speak and act as well. So, when we practice meditation or simply being aware of our daily activities, that 95% of highly irrelevant, unrealistic, unfounded thoughts starts getting dropped off over the course of your practice. And you're left with the valuable, realistic, required 5% only, which is what brings out that peace and contentment you see in people who practice mindfulness and the decision-making powers that come out of it. Some people also think that meditation is being blissed out, you know, like walking on air kind of thing. Of course not. You might get certain amounts of bliss, but usually a person who practices meditation for the purpose of psychological well-being is somebody who's very, very grounded in their usual daily life. 
Meditation is also not concentrating fiercely because some people say, I concentration to concentrate meditation. Karandone. That is a very short sighted view of meditation. Meditation is the ability to understand and accept what life is, as opposed to just keeping your mind on one thing. Because what's the point in doing that? Because you can't live the normal life. Some people also like to boast about being a meditator. In fact, I had a, a psychologist colleague of mine, and in her CV, she had said one of the CV points was meditator. Another was being Buddhist. So I was thinking, oh, how is that supposed to be a point? You know? So these are misconceptions about meditations. In fact, meditation, on the other hand, is a way of life, of really disregarding and dropping off unnecessary thought patterns and habitual tendencies, and just living with what is required. It's a commitment to yourself. It's a private affair. So therefore, if you are interested in, in being emotionally intelligent, being interested in managing your emotions rather than those emotions spilling out onto other people and in the world, two of the more powerful strategies that you could use is being aware of daily activities and meditation. Now, some people also have this issue where their mind is always wandering out and they, however much they meditate or try to be with the present moment, it's very difficult for them to contain their mind and keep it with them. And one of the reasons that this happens is that we tend to think that our thoughts are facts, that our thoughts are actually facts. But let me ask you a question. All of us are adults here. Some of you may be married or had been in relationships, whatever it is. But when you were in school, we may have had another relationship or two or three, whatever. Or we may have had a crush on somebody, like somebody, had a relationship maybe. But now you're not with that person. You're with somebody else. Now, if I had to ask you, recall that boyfriend or girlfriend that you had, or the person the tuition class that you used to hoarding give a letter or whatever. Recall that person and think of the kinds of thoughts that you had about that person then. Now do you have the same thoughts? Of course not. If that person comes from this door, you might rush out from that door because you don't want to even meet the person. But you're you and he's he. Same people. But the thoughts that you had about that person then and the thoughts that you have about that person now is different. So really, thoughts are actually working hypotheses at a given moment, because we ourselves know, for example, the other day I was going through Facebook and the blocked list of people that I had blocked on Facebook. And then I saw these two people that I had blocked. And then I wondered, why do I block these people? They're really nice people. And I unblocked them. And then they sent me send friend requests. And I accepted them. So obviously, the reason I blocked them so many years ago, I had certain working hypotheses about them then. That working hypothesis changed, and I didn't even know what that hypothesis was. It was so severe that I had blocked them on Facebook. But now I unblocked them and accepted their friend request. Now, if we can remember this point, the thoughts are actually not facts. They're just working hypotheses for that moment our tendency to get engrossed in thoughts becomes lesser and lesser. So when you find yourself really mind is wandering to the past, the future, to this fantasy world, you're planning and planning and playing and other plans are working out, your mind is full of thoughts, remind yourself that these thoughts are not facts. Don't take it personally. It's just a bunch of thoughts that come and practice bringing back to your mind on the activity you're doing. When you start doing that, your mind starts getting this flavor, this diagram. Have a look at this diagram. That's very cute. Now, this is a diagram apparently a Montessori teacher gave to a child. Told the child, children in the class, what is the shortest way to get to the milk through the puzzle? So this one clever child went outside the puzzle. The teacher gave a correct mark as well as a red star. Life is also like that. Life is usually very simple. 
We complicate it by imagining a non-existent problem. And what is a non-existent problem? It's the thoughts. But our future, the past fantasies, all these bunches of thoughts like that Podihamaduro. But if we can practice living in the present moment and meditation, if you have found yourself a good meditation teacher, what happens is you circumvent, you just avoid this entire unnecessary bunch of thoughts, which is that puzzle. And instead you only have the working model at that moment which relieves your mind out of a lot of garbage. That is why huge corporates, international corporates like Google or Apple trains their employees on mindfulness workshops, especially their tech, technical staff, their creative directors. That is why the British Parliament, before they start, does a practice of mindful med meditation for five minutes. That is why the, the British education system has brought in mindfulness and present moment awareness training for their schools. So that is the reason to just kind of eradicate and one fine day reduce and reduce all these unnecessary thoughts which are not serving us. And finally, in order for us to really be emotional, so I talked about three things now. First is living in the present moment, meditation, and the perspective that you need to have regarding thoughts, if you're of the nature to be bombarded with thoughts, there are certain personalities like that. The fourth and the final way in which you can be emotionally intelligent is really to clean up your conduct. And conduct is nothing to do with the mind, but all to do with the speech and the body, isn't it? How you uh, get on with daily affairs with other people, etc. It's to do with ethical conduct. So ethical conduct is a word that I borrowed from His Holiness Dalai Lama. He calls it the ethical conduct and many corporates now has that as part of their uh, vision statement for that organization where they're expecting people to be of ethical conduct. So ethical conduct is absolutely behaviors and speech patterns that are not harmful to you as a person and not harmful to another. So we are not talking about gross behavioral deviations like killing somebody or you know taking somebody's deed and writing the deed onto your name kind of thing because those are obviously harmful harmful but what about very subtle things plagiarism you know i i know of people who have who have been uh, phd or master's thesis supervisors who have taken students data and written a paper and published before the two students even thought about it you see now, you might justify those, but those are more subtle things. Looking at somebody's um, uh, work and twisting it and quoting it in your paper without giving due, due credit to that person. Those are subtle levels of misconduct. How about subtle lies? I have an aunt of mine uh, who was a chairperson of a, a state bank, a lady, she was telling me this really interesting story. She was the first chairperson of a state bank in the country, female. So when she took on that, there was a, a JVP conflict that has happened in the, was in the late 1980s. And the security of the various branches of the bank across the country had to be really tightened. But at that time, that bank security didn't have a uniform like we have now this is in the 80s. And you need to have, the security need to have a uniform because how would you know who's security and not? So she ordered to the administration that everybody should get a security and to get a tender call on security uniform stitching. And they got a tender and they found a suitable, like a tailoring company, not a tailor, but a you know, manufacturing for all these security uniforms. Now the security people didn't want to wear a uniform because then they can go about here and there and get caught for doing all sorts of nefarious things. So they spread a rumor saying that my aunt's uncle is a tailor and that she wanted the contract. And my aunt was thinking, it seems my heart moved to parampara a tailor. You know, you can say that. How does it usually happen? Two people might go to the canteen and say, I am in my uniform. I am not in my uniform. I am not in my uniform. I am not in my uniform. And you form a story. And the story gets goes like wildfire. A rumor is made and somebody's reputation is totally ruined. Now, those are ethical misconducts. And we might be doing it a lot. Sometimes we look at somebody and say, You just 
put a little bit of a seed of doubt in somebody's mind without any evidence at all and ruin that person's reputation and character. So these kind of things, gossiping about somebody, you know, getting together over lunch or having a cup of tea and talking about other person's marital situations, child's misbehaviors or financial situation and just making up all these stories just for your fun. And you might think it's fun, but certainly it's not going to be fun for that person. Those are ethical conduct issues. Then faking niceness. You know, you might not like somebody, but you say how wonderful that person is, how fabulous that person is, just to create a relationship so that you can misuse that person's goodwill. That's ethical misconduct. So therefore, if we want to be the best version of emotional intelligence to ourselves, not only should our mind be protected from the practice of present moment awareness, meditation, and containing the wandering mind, but our behavior and speech has to be made special emphasis so that you are really authentic to yourself and in your relationships with others. Thank you very much. There is a question. Uh, yeah, that was a lovely talk. <laughs> and yeah, uh, there is a question. Ma'am, could you please tell some methods to stop, prevent, or control procrastinating? Yeah, so procrastinating is also a type of thought thinking, isn't it? Procrastinating. Those are the procrastinations. So they are also thoughts. So if you practice present moment awareness, say you open your laptop and you're supposed to write this project report. Now you think you're a Facebook ballena. Now on the So you saw the thought going. But you have now heard of present moment awareness. You have heard of mindfulness. So you saw your mind now you're Actually, going, I do sometimes do that. I know that Google, like Facebook, and feel the discomfort in your mind because you know you're doing something that you're not supposed to do. And bring your mind gently back to the Word document that you have opened in which you are going to write a report. So every time the mind wanders with the procrastination, see that it has wandered. Be gentle to yourself. The keyword is gentle. Don't be nasty to yourself. And bring it back to the activity you're doing. If procrastination is a habit in you, it cannot. Because you're not watering that. Every time you go getting give in to procrastination and give in to that behavior, you're watering that habit. It's like watering weeds, which you choke all the beautiful roses off in your garden. And a procrastination, that's how you would do it. That's another question, Pianjati. What exactly is a more evolved person? A more evolved person. Now that's like a general term, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, in psychology, uh, a more evolved, uh, there's a movement in psychology called positive psychology, which is actually looks into qualities of a person who has a great sense of well being. Uh, so I'm just telling you these terms that you can go. So it's they are called signature strengths. There are 24 signature strengths found cross culturally, which indicate which is actually very similar to emotional intelligence, but there's a more detailed explanation. So an, an evolved person is somebody. Some of the characteristics are being very authentic. They're very genuine. You can see that there are some people who, when you look at them on a bicycle handler, they're so stiff because they are keeping a lot within themselves. They're not really, you know, you, you feel strained because you get a headache being with that person. But may evolve person is they're very authentic, they're very natural because there is nothing much to hide. Me. That's one. Secondly, evolved person is somebody who has self-compassion. They like themselves. They forgive themselves. They're okay to themselves. And because of self-compassion, they're compassionate towards others, even their enemies. They're good to them. They evolve. Third is a person who's evolved would be somebody who likes their own company. So solitude is okay for them. Now, that doesn't mean that the evolved person cannot feel unhappy, cannot feel anxious cannot feel irritable because it's a gradual training. He might come to that point later on as the involvement goes. But 
they will also feel envy and sadness and anger but ekak bohoma lawata en aawat ekak alla gan puluwa and they can manage it and contain it within themselves rather than putting it on to other people so those are some of the qualities of an evolved person there's another uh, it's actually a comment more than a question ethical misconduct as you define it professor pianjadi is the main strategy of social and mainstream media these days to enlighten their viewers and readers the media yeah. is, is yeah. misconduct yeah. or conduct is the main uh, ethical misconduct yeah. yeah because i think because people like this as well as darshini yeah. because in fact there was an article by mr modi when he had gone to israel he said that he heard bomb blast in jerusalem that I, i it was really this really struck me and he didn't know this huge blast and said not his hotel and he thought tomorrow morning in the newspaper i can see it because in india it will be on the first page apette mane so when he got the newspaper first page ke ne first page ke to tibune how the israeli government was funding growing trees in the desert so that there be more water so first page was that second third fourth page ke ya konin tibunalu bomb blast chale so then he thought this media reporting is good okay they gave that information but minisu mon gang ausala khul mat kala excite kala prashna etikra netuwa isara denne honda news ek satu tukaran so the problem is when you but when you give this the first story is rape torture means you excite them and some people like it and they the media might feed into it so we need to change our media reporting policies isn't it yeah uh for answer now the uh, just with my general now now when you say mindfulness is it something that one could practice 24 hours or is it only for short periods as all waking moments because it's just your mind is with you na so then uh, now say uh, now unless i plan for future yeah unless what i'm going to do tomorrow morning uh, i plan today how would i do things okay. tomorrow that's a really good that's a good with it always somebody asks this question because for example forget about even planning a big thing what are you going to wear yeah. what am i going to get up yeah. what is the alarm so mindfulness is not that you don't plan you do plan but there are two components to it you plan and let it be with the knowledge that it may not work out that is gives peace ne api then samane plan karwa so oho oho karand mone mem when the moon eto kotha ma stress again second is you plan but the planning is there then up the plan then ko the udahana question let's say i want to go to the washroom then saban kerala gatta me that is you know you have to plan you take the saban kerala and the tua and all that some people can go beyond washroom me go listen at no the mobile at again no the extra those unnecessary thoughts are the ones that you would not be generating with the practice of present moment awareness what is required is done after that you let it be with the possibility that it may not turn out so those are the two components of planning yes should be there but done in that frame of mind is that clear yes it is clear i mean i just was wondering that how much it's practical yes so it is a huge that because one of the things that they have done a lot of research on mindfulness and they found out that people who are actually practicing its productivity is very high because when you have a lot of thoughts it's very tiring to the mind and therefore tiring to the body so you need more hours of sleep so people who practice this actually requires very few hours of sleep because the mind is very open it's very bright අවශ්‍ය සිටුවට එක තමයි තියාගෙන ඉන්නේ අද අර කතා අන්දරයි අර යා කේ පුදේ අර යා මොකද එහෙම කරයි අයි මර ගස්සගෙන ගියේ දෝස් ඇප ස්ටෆ් දෙ ඩ්‍රොප් ඉට් you know but planning is done and that's it so then at the same time you said that uh, of your third point there that uh, uh, emotional intelligence and the, uh, the third point that social awareness that's right so you need to have that social awareness yes because in in you because without social awareness you can i mean you, we are amongst people who may not mean well to us 
So if the, with, when you start practicing present moment awareness, your ability to suss out other people becomes much better. And the manusya kata ta vachana hasan to kino api, the me pani vage. Habe we get the feeling me a sincere ne. In order to detect that intuition, you have to be in the present moment. If you're bombarded with your own avalanche of thoughts here, you can't suss out somebody else. Only if you can suss out, can you protect yourself from people who may not mean well for you. You see, so present moment awareness cuts across all four dimensions of emotional intelligence. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, that uh, very uh, wonderful, uh, um, uh, very thought-provoking, and uh, sort of most applicable to doctors that who are uh, with a busy uh, life and trying to cope up with many, uh, I mean, many many aspects in the life. I mean, maybe private practice and the family Absolutely. life and. Uh, and the work setting as well. So it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Thank you so much. I would like to invite Madam President to hand over the certificate of appreciation to Professor Angeli. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now we have come to the end of a very productive pre Congress workshop. And actually, it's the first pre Congress workshop which was on work-life balance for doctors reclaiming control. Like I would like to thank all four speakers, Dr. Dulangi Dahanayaka, Professor Dhyanath Samarasingha, Professor Shehan Williams, and Professor Priyan Priyanjali Disoisa for those wonderful presentations and spending time here to enlighten all of us on this very important topic. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chaturi Suravira for organizing these speakers and organizing a very successful program. And we have come to the end of it. Thank you, everyone, for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Sudarshan.